Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Biosafety Cabinet Selection, Three Steps for Success. I'm Christy Jewell of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and brought to you by LabConco. To learn more, please visit labconco.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Submit. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also use that Ask a Question box to let us know if you're having any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credit. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credit. I'd now like to welcome our speaker for today's webinar. David Wasesha, Director of Biosafety Products at LabConco Corporation. For a complete biography on David, please visit the biography tab at the top left of your screen. Welcome, David. You may now begin your presentation. Thanks so much, Christy, and welcome everyone today. We're gonna to spend uh, the next several minutes talking about how to navigate the complexities of selecting a class two biosafety cabinet. Um, many of you know this is the functional unit of research in a biosafety or a, a really a life science laboratory. And along the way to selecting a cabinet, there are a lot of different choices that you have to consider. Um, everything from, um, is it the appropriate model for your application to sustainability efforts your laboratory may have um, to, to other requirements outside of your own research and work directly from your facilities. So we're gonna talk about a couple of core uh, things today. Uh, really, the, the first thing is just to get a groundwork for uh, biosafety requirements, depending on the type of work you might be uh, handling in a biosafety cabinet in your research. And then the three areas we're really gonna focus on are understanding the types of biosafety cabinets and understanding which model is most beneficial uh, to your work and to your building. Then we're also gonna look at how to plan for the future and, and keep in mind things like flexibility in scientific research and sustainability for the long haul, as many of you start to look at ways to craft that message and that story with how you conduct your research in your lab. And also we're gonna look at specifics for pairing that BSC with your workflow with uh, unique models and features that can promote improved workflow on your day-to-day -day, uh, laboratory work. So starting off with uh, an understanding of where biosafety cabinets are used cannot be done without an understanding of why we need to use them in the first place. Biosafety cabinets in their name are designed to work with things that are pathogenic or, or hazardous in nature. And when we think about a biohazard, we're typically referring to some kind of agent that's infectious and poses a risk to health, whether that be uh, health of an animal, a plant, or in the case of the last two years of the global pandemic, human health. So when you're working with um, lots of different things in the laboratory, of course, not everything is going to be a biohazard, but you should be very keenly aware of those items that you might be handling that do uh, require additional safety in the, in the area of biohazard protection. There are a lot of different organisms out there that are infectious, and so the best way to classify those is to understand um, the, the resources that you have within your facility and outside of your facility to assess those risks and handle them properly. The best place to start is with your safety office. And that could be at a large institution that might be your biosafety office. It may be a part of your EHS department. For some laboratories, it could be a single person who maybe receives training externally or works with a con uh, consultancy to, to establish parameters that are uh, ensuring that workplace safety is promoted throughout any biohazard application. So a lot of the directives for uh, the, the, the principles of biosafety are going to come from global standards for human health. And uh, more specifically for biosafety, those are traditionally coming from biosafety standards and manuals around the world. And the three most common uh, for, for those of us in North America and much of Europe would be the CDC and its BMBL, currently in the sixth edition. There's also the Canada Biosafety Standard and the, boot, uh, the WHO Biosafety Manual. 
These are just some of many other documents that are out there. And, and these are great general guidances, but your industry or application may require additional safety practices and following additional standards as well, which is why that safety office can be such a great resource for understanding what all might be required for your research and your processes. Within these groups, there's a lot of guidance of, of how to handle specific organisms. So fortunately, you can open one of these documents up and get a lot of specifics on how to be, behave safely in your laboratory. And those are typically uh, outlined uh, by associating a specific pathogen with a risk group rating. If you look at risk groups, they're really uh, assessing several different things that as, as a whole assess the, the biohazard risk for a microorganism. And so risk groups categorize based on typically pathogenicity, transmission, uh, availability of preventative measures such as vaccines for researchers who may be working with these um, more pathogenic or uh, hazardous um, substances. And also uh, looking at uh, if there isn't a vaccine, uh, maybe looking at a treatment as well. And as uh, an analysis of, of everything that happens with that organism is done, it can be bucketed typically into risk groups that range usually from risk group one to risk group four, depending on the document that you're adhering to for biosafety. Now, uh, the, the organism is alone is, is a pathogenic uh, consideration to take into account, but you also have to understand what might be happening with that sample. You know, are you simply just inspecting a tube that's closed or are you pouring that a liquid out, aerosolizing, uh, or putting it through much higher risk procedures that could end up with exposure to a laboratory individual. And so to classify how a risk group should be handled, there are additional biosafety levels that really talk about the preventative measures, both for user behaviors and also for facility design that compromise, uh, that, that um, build up into de describing what are known as biosafety levels. Typically these are BSL one through four where BSL 2, 3, and 4 typically handle things that are hazardous to human health. So where do biosafety cabinets come into this? And the answer is really understanding that relationship between risk groups and biosafety levels, and then assessing the proper way to handle the particular research that you might be conducting. Through a risk assessment with your facility, you might come to the conclusion that certain engineering controls such as a biosafety cabinet are required. Here's one such example from the CDC's BMBL that talks about when um, working in a BSL-2 environment, which you might do very routinely if you're working with human cell lines, uh, the statements that are made in, in the BMBL talk about using primary containment equipment such as a BSC when activities involve aerosols or high splash potential. And it further goes on to discuss the primary uh, containment equipment also being recommended anytime there's high risk infectious agents that are suspected to be in a sample. So one could surmise that working with anything that is pathogenic, uh, has a pathogenic characteristic or is, uh, is significant and relevant to human health could be handled in a biosafety cabinet and really should be. Does not mean that things that are less pathogenic or not pathogenic at all cannot be handled in a class two BSC, but there are, be aware that there are minimum recommendations depending on the risk group for your organism. Now, a biosafety cabinet is a unique type of enclosure in a laboratory, and it's important to really understand the differences between a biosafety cabinet and all other enclosures that are found in laboratories. Across the hundreds of manufacturers of types of enclosures for laboratories and industrial environments, there are lots of different types of formats for hoods, some that keep you safe, some that keep your work safe, and some that keep your work and your, your users safe at the same time. But looking at the hood does not always tell you the whole story. So it's really important for you to understand if you're buying a new hood, what is the type of, of hood that you're buying? Is it a fume hood or otherwise? And what's that level of protection that it's offering? With a biosafety cabinet, these are enclosures that are designed specifically for, for biological aerosols and uh, less so for chemical fumes, but uh, they're, and obviously they're quite a bit different than a fume hood, which is designed specifically for chemical fumes and vapors. 
we'll go on and understand the differences between these two a little bit further. But understanding that this risk is really a critical component because you as the user or the lab manager or the facilities person may go and turn on a hood, but air is invisible and it's really difficult to understand what exactly is happening with that hood's performance without smoke visualization. So a biosafety cabinet, <clears throat> this is designed for biohazardous aer aerosols. And you often see this type of hood in applications such as those that are on the screen. <clears throat> so uh, oftentimes, one of the most common uses in academic settings would be for cell and tissue culture. You also see these routinely in microbiology and pathology uh, settings. So analyzing human health samples or maybe food microbiology. Then also looking for clinical diagnostics applications such as COVID diagnosis. Or furthermore, looking at uh, much more high, high, high importance sterility applications like producing cell and gene therapies where we're growing and modulating cells for human injection, or even preparing chemotherapies and other IV drugs that are sterile and must be injected directly into humans. So continuing on, <clears throat> it's critical to understand how a class two BSC works. The only true way to understand exactly how air flows through a product like a biosafety cabinet is to visualize with smoke. So if you take a look at the, the inlet grill of the biosafety cabinet, you can see there's air being pulled into that top image, and that represents inflow air that is pulling and containing hazards in the room and pulling it underneath the work surface. So that, that force of air protects the user, but it also prevents contaminated room air from entering that sterile working area. Once the biosafety cabinet distributes that air up through its internal components, it's gonna push that air downward, and that's offering product protection, which is uh, a clean environment that's HEPA filtered and is aseptic in nature. You'll notice as the smoke moves down over that work area, it's flowing very smoothly and calmly. And we often refer to that as laminar or more appropriately, unidirectional airflow. This flow of air really works to ensure that the, the working area is non-turbulent and samples can get bathed in clean air without any disruption or contamination from sample to sample, or from inside the cabinet to outside, or vice versa. So in summation, a class two BSE is providing personnel protection, that's user protection, with an air barrier at the front of the cabinet. It's also providing product protection, which is sterile, HEPA-filtered, laminar downflow air. And it's also providing protection from the environment, because all of this air is then once again being filtered through HEPA filters before returning to the room environment. So continuing on, much of the biosafety cabinet cannot be seen from the outside for a user. And that's an important thing because the biosafety cabinet is inherently a containment vessel. To get a better understanding of how this cabinet works, you have to be aware that there are some things that are going on with airflow that's distributed through the back of the cabinet and then up and filtered through HEPA filters before it returns into the work area. So this slide just simply some eights, the, the flow of air from the room into the, the, the back channel behind uh, the, all of the working areas, and then it's on its way through filtration through HEPA filters back into the work area. Should also be noted at this time, be very mindful of how your biosafety cabinet is connected to either back into the room or to the exhaust system for a building. When a biosafety cabinet is recirculating its air back into the room, it is not okay to work with chemical vapors because those vapors will pass directly through a HEPA filter. Understanding how your biosafety cabinet is gonna operate is really the first step in understanding how you can work with it safely. But understand that before you get to the biosafety cabinet, there are typically lots of factors that are in play to make sure that the product is designed to be safe and supportive of your work, whether it's very low risk or very high risk. Most manufacturers who are building quality BSEs are gonna design them to a global standard. The most well-known standard in the world is NSF ANSI standard 49. This is a globally recognized document that changes every year and adapts to new technologies to make sure that, that manufacturers are adhering to the highest, most stringent requirements for universal biosafety containment. 
It also defines how biosafety cabinets should be constructed and also talks about different formats of BSCs, which we will address in the next several slides. There are other standards out there as well. Uh, many of them have their roots in NSF 49. NSF 49 is truly the, the most up-to-date version that constantly receives attention. I also want to point out that like many standards, they are a grounds for the basis of the cabinet's design, but there are many features that influence additional behaviors about your cabinet that promote safer, safer work and a better understanding for users of how they're interfacing with the cabinet on a day-to-day -day basis. So diving right into biosafety cabinet structure, there are several subtypes to be aware of. The most common de uh, design of a biosafety cabinet is a class two type A2 model. And this is a recirculating design that pulls air from the room, filters it, and pushes it back to the room after the, the air is passed through the entire cabinet. This design is really common for microbiology and other types of work that involves regular bio, you know, pathogenic materials, but not for chemicals because the air is recirculated back to the room. If chemicals are used, and, and we're talking more than just ethanol or a disinfectant at the end of the day or prior to work, if more chemicals are used, such as odors or light duty chemicals, an A2 can be configured with an exhaust connection on the top of the unit. These designs of A2 cabinets have a partial recirculation to them. And that means that they are really for designed for work with smaller volumes of chemicals. And, and the idea there is to prevent concentration of chemicals in the work area that may eventually lead to an explosive limit. So I, A2 cabinets are great for that small, quick procedure with chemicals, but really they're, they're almost best for applications that are microbiology, biohazardous, but include unpleasant odors, such as potentially handling fecal cell samples. So you'll notice again, uh, that purple area now, we've gone from blue to purple. Purple signifies an area where it's okay to work with some chemicals, but be mindful of your usage. And here again is just a bigger demonstration of that area where anywhere in the work area is safe for minute volumes of chemicals, but be mindful of recirculation. So when you hear about type A2 BSEs, again, they're very common and many laboratories employ them for routine cell culture and other similar work. There are lots of pros to a type A cabinet. Uh, they're very great, you know, the, many biological applications work for class two A2 BSCs. Um, they can also be used for small volumes of chemicals and they're relatively easy to exhaust with building systems. Uh, they're, they're also, while they, they do cost some amount of money as you're venting air out of the building, they're quite a bit cheaper to run and much uh, less complex than a type B2 cabinet. Do be aware if you have an A2 that you are restricted to small volumes of chemicals. And this design also can never really be con you know, connected and converted into a model that provides an even higher level of chemical safety. So there are other BSCs for work that may involve solvents or higher volumes of chemicals. And they came into lights about 40 or so years ago. Uh, this is a family of, of class two BSCs called type B2 cabinets. And they are uh, really designed for work that involves excess volumes of hazardous chemicals. B2 cabinets and B1 cabinets, the two cabinets that are in the B family, are both quite temperamental in how they run. And oftentimes it requires lots of extra planning on the mechanical construction side of the hood. So the duct work and the venting and the exhaust blower to make sure that all goes well. The first type of BSC that is in the type B family is the B1. And this is a cabinet that is very difficult to use for operators to ensure safety. You'll notice in the front of the cabinet, there's a blue area where it's okay to work with recirculating uh, uh, applications and no chemicals. In the back area, there's a red area that denotes an area where it's safe to work with uh, hazardous chemistry that needs to be vented to the outside without recirculation. And then you'll notice a purple area again in the middle. And this defines an area where air is recirculating uh, in the front, exhausted in the back, and that purple line is a smoke split line in the cabinet. 
This user, this line is invisible to users. So oftentimes when you see a B1 cabinet, there's information that's supplied with the man, from the manufacturer of that cabinet that says extreme user training for a B1 has to be considered. Otherwise, a user may end up working with chemicals in the front of the cabinet and become uh, create an unsafe condition. B1 cabinets also have to be dedicated to one exhaust duct run and one blower per biosafety cabinet, which means you cannot connect these easily or safely to a, sh a shared exhaust system, such as with other fume hoods in a building. Furthermore, if the exhaust system does not behave correctly, the B cabinet itself has to recognize an issue with that cabinet or with the exhaust system and then shut down within 15 seconds leaving the air dead and a user with an unsafe condition, including hazardous microbiology coming out of the cabinet potentially. B2 cabinets were another development that turned a, a class two B into a total exhaust biosafety cabinet. So if you look at this design, you'll notice the entire work area is red, and that means that it's safe to work with hazardous chemicals in addition to microbiological samples at any time in any area of the B2 cabinet. However, there are restrictions that come with these cabinets. The one uh, big, big limiting factor is again, this design has to be connected to exhaust duct run um, uh, facility infrastructure at all times. It also exhausts a substantial amount of air because the entire work area is 100% vented to the outside. And in doing all of this, you still have the same restriction where if the cabinet does not have sufficient exhaust, it must shut down very fast and prevent an issue where the cabinet um, uh, would potentially push hazards into the room. So it, it is a is a risky situation to have a B2 that does not have a su sufficient exhaust blower or a stable exhaust blower. So many times, uh, you may see text or language or questions that say B2s are a safe biosafety cabinet. And this slide will really, the, the focus here is to address when that statement is true. So for type B2 cabinets, for biohazards, they actually, type B2 cabinets offer no additional safety versus an I, a type A or a type C cabinet. That's because the benchmark for assessing biosafety and biocontainment for a class two BSC is developed and tested to a certain standard that the BSC was made and constructed and tested to. So in the case of NSF 49, the biocontainment principles and requirements for a class two BSC do not change from type to type. In the case of chemicals, a B2 cabinet can offer additional safety over uh, an A cabinet or another cabinet, but the the instances there must require that the cabinet is running properly. B2 cabinets and B1 cabinets rely entirely on the building for their exhaust, and the building is a separate system from the, ca the cabinet itself, which means that getting these two to marry and work properly can be very difficult, and even after it works properly, it may uh, the conditions may change due to fluctuations in temperature from the building to the outside or other conditions where uh, maybe a B2 may be shared with other exhaust ductwork such as a fume hood. So in summary, looking at Bs, the pros for them is they do provide exhaust and dedicated chemical safety for a type B2 cabinet, but there are lots of cons and that includes the dedicated duct run, uh, bees always must be vented, so you're always wasting expensive air by dumping that straight out of your building. Uh, they also have that limitation where they have to shut down very quickly in the event of an exhaust failure in a building. It does happen, and if there's no redundancy or additional power supply for that blower, it can create an extremely dangerous situation. Furthermore, uh, looking at the volume of air that's displaced out of the building by a B2, is it, you have to look at how it compares to an A2 that may be vented. And B2s use about twice as much energy as an A2 that is can to be vented, which means they are twice as costly to run for every bit of, of research and work that's done in the cabinet. Lastly, there's no flexibility with type B2 cabinets. So imagine you select a type B2 cabinet because you're doing some chemical work. And then six months later, you've changed your processes or perhaps the researcher that was doing that work has left your facility and you've picked up a different project. 
well, maybe you don't need to vent the cabinet anymore. But with a type B cabinet, you are always committed to that exhaust uh, out of the building, whether you're working with a simple E. coli sample or a large volume chemical buffer inside of a uh, biosafety cabinet. To help understand the mechanical complexities of a building, here's a quick diagram just to give you a picture of, of uh, a facility that has a clean room and several biosafety cabinets. Um, in this condition, there are, are actually, although it's called out as five, there are a total of six BSCs on this drawing, and they are sharing ductwork all together to make use of a single blower. And that's really great when you have a, a, a non-B2 cabinet or a non-B cabinet, because you can gang other types of biosafety cabinets, such as type A and type C. Unfortunately, with type Bs, when they're ganged together like this, they're very sensitive and have lots of uh, uh, support uh, of, of consistent um, stability with their airflow. And sometimes it's very difficult to get them to work properly, which means in turn that a user may be posed, uh, put in risk if the exhaust system does not balance all cabinets appropriately. So there are several documents and statements talking about doing anything but this kind of design with type B cabinets. But unfortunately, many times mechanical planners for buildings do not have the considerations for B cabinets in mind. They haven't done their homework with the, the manuals and the requirements for the industry and pose risk to users. And, and even just to get the BSC up and running can be a challenge. So there are other options. Um, you can use a type A2, but that has restrictions with chemical safety. And so there is another type of BSC that may be selected for these types of labs that either have flexibility concerns you know, what's gonna happen five to 15 years down the road, uh, or they're just uh, really focused on energy reduction and savings without really uh, losing any safety at all. And so the type C1 is, is that, that BSC that can help with all of those concerns about A's versus B's, or really just future-proofing your cabinet for, for the remainder of its life. So type C ones are flexible in the sense that they can work in either A, recirculating mode, or B, exhausted mode. And when they're in that B mode, when you decide to vent the cabinet, you would simply certify the BSC and connect it to exhaust duct. And in that B mode, you have a 100% dedicated vent area from the central part of the work surface, which is well-defined and easy to follow as a worker. When ducted, there are also much easier connection points for the C1 to the building. So it has smaller exhaust volume to save that energy and cost of conditioning. And it also has much lower exhaust uh, static pressure or, or suction requirements of the cabinet. And additionally, it, this type of cabinet can be connected with many other BSCs and fumes on the same shared ductwork. So it's much easier to incorporate whether you are planning for a new large building or you're planning for renovating an existing building that has a whole set of duct infrastructure already implemented. As I mentioned, there's flexibility, and that means that you can go back and forth from A to B mode with a simple certification and connecting the cabinet to ductwork or just or removing it from ductwork. So every six months or a year or so when you, that certification happens is a great time for this BSC to change its course and save your laboratory crucial exhaust air. The work surface is designed in such a way that there's segments to help understand where it's safe to work. There are also NSF approved flat work surfaces for the entire work area to be flush if you wanna use this in just a recirculating mode. And additionally, in that vented mode, in that B mode, this cabinet also has other features that keep users safe when building conditions may not be stable. And this cabinet actually has the ability to run for an additional five minutes to keep the biohazards within the cabinet and to protect a user from loss of containment due to building failure. The type C1 BSEs look like this image here, and they have that dedicated central area to work in, which really promotes the area where you handle your samples in active state. So it really promotes aseptic workflow with your consumables on the left, your work in the middle and you're discarding on the right. And it keeps that left to right or right to left flow, depending on your preference for aseptic work. Looking at sustainability is a really critical part of any decision 
for today's modern laboratories. You, you want to be conscious of those, those factors that really eat excess energy. And laboratories are one of the most um, energy con consuming uh, locations uh, out there. And, and, and to do a little bit uh, on retaining some of that energy savings can go a long way, not only into the messaging for your laboratory and its, its commitment to green development, but also it means direct savings for your facility. A great way to look at this is the energy consumption by the exhaust air from a bio cabinet. So there's energy consumption just for running a biosafety cabinet, but looking at um, the, the exhaust air alone, you can see some pretty significant values associated with running BSCs. So recirculating cabinets are just taking room air and recirculating within the room, so there's zero cost. With a canopy to A2, you're exhausting about four, uh, forty to forty-five thousand dollars over fifteen years of the cabinet's life. So that's a pretty substantial cost. With a B2 that's providing the same level of, of bio protection with just a little bit of added chemical protection, that number more than doubles. And as you can imagine, a hundred thousand dollars over the course of fifteen years is almost the cost of a, a new B2 BSC every year. So it's very expensive to run. A C1 gets you that same protection factor as a B2 but at a much lower cost. So it pays for itself very quickly if you're gonna know that you're gonna be doing chemical style work. And it also promotes additional safety factors that a B does not allow. So to summarize these types, you have the type A2, which is very common for routine microbiology and cell culture work that does not inv involve hazardous chemicals. It can be vented to the outside with a canopy or symbol connection for light duty applications involving chemicals or odors. B cabinets are 100% are exhaust for higher volumes of chemicals, but have lots of limitations that impact both expensive installations and operating costs, and also safety risk to users. And the type C1 bridges that gap by offering a type A2 or type B2 style environment within the cabinet, allows you to switch between the two as your needs flex and change, and also allows for really easy installation, reduced costs for operating, and provides additional safety that's not found in an A2 or a B2 cabinet. As you consider all of these factors, you also want to be mindful of that sustainability message that happens outside of, of the individual type of BSC, but for all types of BSCs. And so some of the things you should really be paying attention there are, are really the opportunities to reduce total consumption by the product and also consumption by the upkeep and ongoing maintenance for a biosafety cabinet. Many times, uh, facilities who are looking for lead credits or, or looking at sustainability metrics are going to look towards the energy consumption for a device. One of the most power-hungry devices in a laboratory uh, based on energy consumption at the device itself is an ultra-low temperature freezer, such as a minus 80. Biosafety cabinets, in, in comparison, use a significantly less amount of energy to, to, uh, to operate the internal blowers that they, they work off of. And you can easily contact any reputable manufacturer to understand the watts and the consumption for a BSC. And in looking at a type A2 recirculating cabinet, these are, are enclosures that use about $50 or so in the US per year to operate in a recirculating fashion. So they're, they're quite energy efficient today for many models. As you look at that though, you need to also consider is the cabinet being exhausted and does my application really, really warrant exhausting of the process? Many times there's a, a misconception that exhausting a process of just microbiolog microbiological samples makes the process safer. When in reality, you become reliance partially or fully on that exhaust system to provide safety. And in doing so, actually transfer some of the responsibility of safety away from an intelligent BSC and into a totally separate system in the exhaust. So not only is it less safe, but you're also spending energy. So evaluating whether or not you need to exhaust a, a hood is a really critical step into sustainability and safety. And that's where that type C1 can make a big difference in allowing you to flex and change as your applications change. I think it, the other piece that's really critical is to pay attention to 
the energy as an important factor, a benchmark for how the product is designed, but really to understand all of the other factors that influence how much money is added into the, the ownership of a BSC or maintenance. And so the, the area to look at there is, is keenly focused on avoiding landfill and, and secondary and tertiary um, disruptors to sustainability. One of the big things there is to look at construction quality and the longevity of a biosafety cabinet. They really, today, a BSC should be designed to last no less than 15 years without any major service besides filters. Filters are internal to the cabinet and are the routine maintenance uh, component for a bio cabinet. When we talk about routine, we're talking in the order of close to 10 years or more for, for uh, blowers that are supporting oper uh, airflow through a cabinet. Many cabinets do not have extra reserve capacity to withstand filter loading. And when you do not have that, you, your, your energy costs may look low because the blowers are using less energy, but your end up, your total costs are quite high because you're spending perhaps a thousand US dollars or more for a filter change. You have someone who's driving to your facility, polluting the environment, throwing away filters, all just so you can save a little bit of energy cost up front. And so the total perspective of a cabinet over its life is critical to investigate. <clears throat> Lastly, you also want to be mindful of how the cabinet is constructed and work with a reputable manufacturer who's sourcing recycled content, that's the steel and other components that go into the hood, and making sure that they stay in such a state that they can be recycled at the end of the product's life. Many times, biosafety cabinets are being carefully deconstructed and decontaminated at the end of their life now and recycled as much as possible, which really reduces that landfill char characteristic. So the last piece I want to talk about is identifying not only the right style and type of BSC, but also focusing on, on what uh, modifications and customizations are, are available to you to make your work safer and easier and more friendly when you're spending long time, periods of time in a biosafety cabinet. So at the core of a BSC's structure is that compliance to NSF or EN or other global standards. And Adhering to that design is critical because it ensures the product is going to perform real safe and be uh, you know, reputable design. But there are things that are out there that influence and improve the way some of your work gets done. So be mindful of, of those additional uh, modifications and things that can be selected to ensure you're selecting a biosafety cabinet that fits your work and allows you to do it as safely as possible. So some of those modifications uh, I'm, I've got in these next few slides. One of those big ones is micro, uh, microscope integrations and adaptations. You'll notice in this image here, we have uh, two different ways to integrate microscopes. On the left, there is an inverted microscope sitting there with eyepieces passing through the lens. Uh, and and then the, the lenses are coming through the, uh, uh, the glass sash of the BSC. This design allows for a user to work safely with cell culture flasks that may be open and biohazardous or uh, maybe working with dissection microscopes to, to view a stereoscope and get closer work to something that's pathogenic or biohazardous while still maintaining proper airflow and containment within a BSC. On the right is another option that involves integrating a larger uh, microscope design into the work surface, and that promotes a better um, airflows through the cabinet and also ergonomics for a user to work smoothly across the biosafety cabinet design. So these are options. Uh, out there for microscopy and cabinets. There's also additional micro uh, integrations that, that can go on beyond microscope integration. And uh, as many of you are starting to work with additional devices and, and designs in cabinets, you may be aware of larger instruments that need to go into BSCs that are doing critical steps and functions in, in the biosafety cabinet. For instance, here is an automated bioreactor, and it is connected through lots of different uh, pass-throughs and cords to support all of the complexities of the cabinet and the, uh, and the bioreactor itself, while still allowing for good airflow and the, and, and the ergonomics are still maintained for a user. Some of you may also be working with samples that are for human health and are going to be injected, so cell therapies or gene therapies or other sterile products that are processed in accordance with the GMPs. 
in doing so, you may have additional requirements for monitoring. In this case, there's an isokinetic probe for air sampling that collects air from the work area and helps validate the sterility of your product. In this design, uh, a funnel can be added and integrated into the biosafety cabinet rather than running extra lines through the whole work area, which can be difficult to clean. Many of your processes may also include digital laboratory notebooks or other processes that are, are best displayed on screens associated with the biosafety cabinet, either integrated into the back wall or connected through a laptop arm or a monitor arm. And these are things that you should work with closely with your manufacturer because they really influence how little space you have in your laboratory and how best you can maximize the area that the BSE is taking up by integrating uh, monitors and getting rid of things like uh, computer carts. Those of you who are working with instruments that are also quite a bit larger uh, may also find that your BSC is not big enough, even if you do some basic modifications to it. And so on the left, we have uh, one such liquid handler that fits well into a biosafety cabinet, but a liquid handler such as a Hamilton Star may be too large for a standard BSC. In, in fact, this model, particularly the Hamilton Star, is too large for a regular BSC. So be aware of other conform, um, conforming products that help maintain class two airflows and support automation uh, as well. And so some of the formats that are out there are, are wide and diverse and highly customized and expensive, but there are options that are, are very, very compatible with many different types of liquid handlers, cell sorters, and other instruments that are too large for regular BSC. So these large enclosures are available in, in different formats, but what you really wanna focus in on is in understanding the space requirements for your instrument, and then working with a manufacturer who's got a lot of experience closely designing these products, testing them with instruments inside of them, and making sure that all of that is maintaining class two protection for personnel, that's you, the user, for the product that's hand, being handled inside the enclosure, and at the same time, maintaining ergonomics safety and comfort. So these are just a few of the selection options that you have to consider both with the type of the BSC, the, the sustainability considerations and cost savings for your facility as they pertain to both uh, operational costs and safety costs. And then also being mindful of other ways to select BSCs that can be adapted to improve your workflows and make your day easier in the laboratory or wherever you might be using a class two BSC. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, questions that have come in during the presentation. And thanks again for joining. Thank you, David, for that informative presentation. It is now time to start our live Q&A portion of the webinar. Now to our audience, if you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just use that ask a question box, type it in there and click submit, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, David, let's get started. We have lots of questions that have come in here. Uh, let's start with this one. Why would I want to use a type C instead of a type B? Good question. Um, so a, a type C cabinet is gonna be that cabinet that can work for any type of application, whether it's COVID samples or it's Ebola samples. Uh, all are suitable uh, on the biological side. The difference really with a C is is on the chemistry and, and chemical vapor handling side. A C is gonna be a lot easier to integrate into a building. It's got flexibility in terms of um, how much air it exhausts, um, how safe it is that are, are least and bounds ahead of a type B cabinet. So it's providing the same level of protection by having 100% exhausted air without a lot of the hangups and hiccups that type B2 cabinets can sometimes bring to the party. Thanks, David. Our next, next question. We work with tuberculosis samples. Is an A2 okay for this type of work? So uh, as a biosafety cabinet manufacturer, our, our, our recommendation is always going to be for you to consult most closely with your biosafety officer or your EHNS office and, and understand the, the facility requirements and the local requirements for handling any biohazard. Uh, now, for something like tuberculosis, this is you know, obviously a, a highly infectious pathogenic um, uh, organism that we really don't want to have anything to do with, and we want to make sure we handle it safely. So um, a biohazard uh, such as this 
is, is not a chemical risk by itself. And so we want to make sure that we look at does a cabinet have the ability to contain? And all class two BSCs are going to provide that same level of biocontainment. So an A2 is acceptable. You may just be aware of, and especially because we have lots of international guests, uh, your country may have specific requirements for handling tuberculosis in a vented uh, enclosure, but there is no known benefits to exhausting a BSC uh, for handling tuberculosis so samples. The common misconception. Great, thanks for that answer, David. Next question. We just bought a new liquid handler. Can we still get a biosafety cabinet for it? This is also a great question. Um, so thank you for asking. Um, when, when you're buying a liquid handler, I have been in this case before where you're very excited about how fast it's going to make your work and it's going to automate your process so you can, you know, go work on other more important things than transferring liquids from, from uh, sample uh, to, through the different phases of a process. It also means that you may have forgotten to look at the BSC and it sounds like in this case, this user has done that. Um, the, the answer is, is really you want to look closely at the liquid handler you have, collect all of the information about the model, and then go to a manufacturer of a larger enclosure and understand what types of options they have for, for containing that liquid handler. So in, in the case of um, large enclosures, such as the ones that LabConco makes, there are lots of different options uh, for, for different sizes and connections and, and customizations that can support adapting an enclosure to the liquid handler you may have already bought. Having said that, do be aware that some instruments do require very large or sometimes even completely customized in, in uh, containment. So most liquid handlers, that's not the case, but if you have a large robotics process with multiple steps, uh, may require additional conversation. Great, David. We're going to try squeezing in a few more questions. We have quite a few coming in. Um, I do want to let our audience know that any of the questions we are unable to get to, we will be answering them via email to the email address that you provided at the time of registration. All right, David, what is the difference between a vented and non-vented filter BSC for COVID testing? It's a good question. Um, yeah, so, so COVID testing by itself is uh, for, for, for testing of a pathogenic you know, human sample, a clinical sample requires in the US just a BSL-2 containment. And that means to traditionally you're working with that sample if it's still pathogenic in a class two BSE. It could be any one of the, of the types of class two BSEs that are out there. So it could be recirculating or vented to the outside. COVID is, is a viral particulate, right? So it's a, it's a virus in nature. So as you're handling it, the HEPA filters within the BSE are gonna be entirely responsible for capturing that that the COVID sample, the virus. And so there's really not a benefit at all or even a requirement to venting a class two BSC for working with COVID testing. The only situation where you may choose to vent a COVID processing BSC is if for some reason you were also working with additional chemicals or, or, or something smelly, like a different sample besides the COVID sample, maybe, maybe a fecal sample or you want to vent the other out. But inherently there is no real requirement uh, with a BSC to, to vent it out for COVID. David, what cabinet do you recommend for animal work? Good question. Um, so there are lots of different types of enclosures for uh, safe biohazardous animal, animal handling. Um, many times if you look at the offerings um, that are out there, there are, it depends on the process that is occurring. So it may be that you are exchanging an animal from cage to cage, such as a mouse, and there are great transfer stations that are designed for that type of work that provide both user and, and sample protection or, or animal protection. Um, if you're working with surgeries or doing a, a thing a little bit more critical with that animal, um, then typically there are class two biosafety cabinets that are specialty designs for working with animals. The key design concept there is, is usually a larger sash opening to allow for passing of, of smaller cages in and out of the work area, such as a 12 inch sash opening. All right, and it looks like we have time for one more question. Are class two B2 cabinets louder than others? I'm looking for a quiet cabinet. Does that exist? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so I mentioned earlier that class two BSCs 
are driven by uh, a billing exhaust blower. So internally in a B2 cabinet, there is just a smaller blower typically uh, for supplying air down over the work area. The remaining air is sucked out from the building itself. And as that happens, there is a substantial volume of air that is pulled through a B2 cabinet. It's, it's quite, quite loud because it's double the air of a type A2 or a type C1 cabinet. So um, if you look at the manufacturer's specs for all B2 cabinets, they typically say they're pretty quiet, but that is because they're measuring the volume, the noise intensity for the cabinet, and rarely the whole picture where they're looking at the total exhaust volume. So really B2 cabinets should be avoided for many reasons. And one of those extra, extra reasons down the road is that volume um, and you know, temperamentalness that they also bring with them. David, thank you so much for all of this information. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, I wanted to just, again, thank you all for your time and your fantastic questions. I know there are lots of other questions that did not get answered just during our short time today and we will address those directly afterwards for those of you who have questions. Uh, if you have more information uh, on BSCs that you're requesting or want additional help, feel free to visit labconco.com and get in touch with one of our several specialists for biosafety cabinets. Otherwise, thanks so much again for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thank you again, David. And just a reminder to our audience, today's webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. A big thank you again to David Lasesha and Lab Conco, and we hope you all have a great day.